Can we get an amen, somebody? <laughs> that song is from Susan Werner's album, The Gospel Truth, which is basically agnostic gospel music. I recommend it. Several of her, several of her songs are um, favorites among UUs, though she is not herself a UU, officially. I better take my mask off, thank you. I guess I'm so used to wearing it. So, speaking of singing, do you know why you use are generally bad hymn singers? Because we're always reading ahead to see if we agree with the next line. <laughs> and some people say we don't sing hymns, we sing hers. So, oddly, this may have been the most difficult reflection I've ever written. It's been hard for me to find a starting point for talking about UU humor. And no, UU humor is not an oxymoron. So I think back in time, my interest in UU humor started, perhaps surprisingly, at GA, the UU General Assembly, in Salt Lake City about 20 years ago. I was fascinated by the exhibit hall, which I still think may be the best thing about GA. I pounced on this book of UU jokes. It's called The Church Where People Laugh. And when I bought it, the book was in its third printing, and when I checked a few years ago for a service like this, it was in its fourth edition. Now, I am very sorry to report, the book is no longer available through the UUA bookstore. I guess some of the jokes about fax machines were getting a little dated. But fortunately, we now have the UU Hysterical Society. That's hysterical, which I also discovered at GA two years ago in Spokane, when somebody, it may have been Tanya Stevens, showed me a get out of hell free card. So I hurried to the exhibit hall, found the UU Hysterical Society booth, and picked up a card myself. Now, of course, you can't read it, but the image is um, the little guy from the Monopoly game with the mustache and the cane, and he's escaping a birdcage full of flames. And then the text says, this card excuses the bearer from conversations regarding personal saviors, salvation, and church attendance. That's the UU Hysterical Society. They be believe in mirth and dignity. And they have a Facebook group you can join, for those of you who use Facebook, and I sometimes share to our page some of their postings. And there's also a monthly email list I just discovered and subscribed to, and I hope to be getting a monthly update of new jokes. And there are worship resources, too, on their website, and it's www.uuhystericalsociety.com. That's UU Hysterical Society, all one word, no caps. They also offer a lot of fun merchandise. I particularly like the hip flasks that say things like, for when thoughts and prayers are not enough. And this is my spiritual practice. I picked up a couple of their little posters at GA and hope to get them placed around the building sometime. But notice I've had them for two years. Seriously, folks, the one, there, there's one way to begin thinking about humor, and that's to begin by being um, serious. Many things are serious, and there's nothing wrong with that. Dignity is, after all, part of the UU Historical's tagline about mirth and dignity. But other things try too hard to be serious and end up being solemn instead. That distinction between the serious and the solemn was laid out in a newspaper column in 1978 by Russell Baker, for those of you who were aware of punditry back that far. He didn't really define his terms. Instead, he gave sets of paired examples. For, and some of them aren't easily pulled out of that 45-year-old historical context. But here are a couple. Poker is serious. Jogging is solemn. You have to get, you buy books about jogging. Humphrey Bogart movies about private eyes are serious. Modern movies that are sophisticated jokes about hu Humphrey Bogart movies are solemn. A serious candidate like Adlai Stevenson, who, as Sandra Oldendorf reminded us a few years ago, uh, is a UU, he, a, solemn, a serious candidate like Stevenson was defeated by a solemn one, Dwight Eisenhower, and so on. A few years later, my friend Elizabeth Valance sharpened the distinction. In an article about the uses of humor in educational research in that august academic journal Curriculum Inquiry, she suggested that the solemn is self-conscious. It tries hard to be taken seriously and is at least a little bit pretentious. The solemn is aware of the struggle and provides its own fanfare. For an example closer to hand, I'll give you this. 
Our first UU principle, affirming the inherent worth and dignity of every person, is serious, and we seriously affirm it. But changing the slogan, standing on the side of love, to just side with love, because the word standing is ableist, is solemn. Looking beyond the serious to recognize the solemn opens the way to broaden our perspective, to begin to see ourselves from the outside, to see things from a new perspective. And that new perspective is how humor works as well. Several years ago, I was one of a handful of us from this congregation who attended a monthly Talking with Neighbors interfaith panel on humor and religion. And I would pay hard money to see Rabbi Ed Staffman and Father Leo Proxel tell jokes. They are really good. Father Proxel does this Irish accent that's wonderful. Um, in that panel, Father Proxel said, humor has to do with the discrepancies in life. It is the best and quickest way to the truth, sometimes through a back door. It's valuable as long as we get a perspective out of it. And now I have to ask myself, how solemn is it to take notes at a discussion of humor? <laughs> Much humor, especially in the context of religion, depends on that perspective being shared. On that panel, Father Leo and Rabbi Ed both talked about religious humor being self-deprecating, and they noted that much religious humor comes in the form of inside jokes. This form of humor in, in jokes, it, it, through in-jokes can be a way of building or recognizing community. In fact, most of the jokes this morning are in-jokes, and so our visitors will get a an unusual perspective on our uh, faith community. We do like having a laugh at our own expense, and most of the, book, the jokes in, the, in this book are in-jokes. We've laughed at ourselves for a long time. Perhaps the oldest UU joke is attributed to Reverend Thomas Starr King, a famous Unitarian preacher who died in 1864. He died in 1864. And he's the for whom uh, Star King School for the Ministry is named. He is credited with observing that the difference between Universalists and Unitarians is that Universalists believe that God is too good to damn us, and Unitarians believe that we're too good to be damned. <laughs> Another famous 19th century Unitarian, Edward Everett Hale, and he wrote um, one of my favorite readings in our hymnal, number 457, about I am one, but I will do what I can do. Um, he was for a long time a chaplain, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Somebody asked him, do you pray for the senators, Dr. Hale? He said, no, I look at the senators and I pray for the country. <laughs> that one may not be quite so funny these days. So the point... We've had the serious, the solemn, and the point is that humor provides us with a healthy change of perspective, a way to set aside the solemn so we may better understand the serious more deeply. Or, as David Andes put it in one of the little signs he made for our booth at Catapalooza, evil trembles before humor. It's also a way we recognize our religious community and what makes it unique. It's how we know each other. So now for some jokes. That's what you've been waiting for, right? Enough with the serious and the solemn. A prosperous looking man came into a small town hoping to mail a letter. He asked a young boy, excuse me son, can you tell me how to get to the post office? The boy instantly rattled off the directions. The man was impressed and said to the boy, say, you sound like an intelligent young lad. I'm the Reverend Billy Bob Beauregard. I should be doing an accent, shouldn't I? I'm the Reverend Billy Bob Beauregard and I'm having a tent revival meeting just outside of town tonight. I'd like for you and your parents to come, and I'll show you the way to the Lord. The boy, who'd been attending UU religious education, thought for a moment and said, that's a pretty tall order for a guy who can't find the post office. <laughs> <coughs> and perhaps that was the boy in this probably true story that gave its name to the, the book about the church where people laugh. A young mother and former Baptist spent many Sundays visiting different churches with her seven-year-old son. They were not pleased with any of them. But when they visited the First Unitarian Church of Detroit, all the boy could say for a week afterward was, can we go back to the church where people laugh? Have you heard what one UU goldfish said to the other? If there's no God, then who keeps changing the water? <laughs> and here's a quote from a UU we've all heard about and heard from in a recent Sunday service. 
When asked if he's really a clergyman, Robert Fulgham replied, I am a minister in a religious community, the Unitarian Universalist Association. Our motto is, we don't ever leave well enough alone. <laughs> there are two answers to this next one. It's the, why did somebody cross the road? Why did the UU cross the road? First answer, because the Catholics said it would be a sin. Second answer, to get to the coffee pot. And finally, how does the UUA excommunicate members? Take away their coffee. When I lived in California, I did some work with the California Coastal Commission. The commission was a very progressive agency at that time with jurisdiction over development in the coastal zone. One day at a lunch break at a commission meeting, some environmentalists who had attended were looking for one of the commissioners named Chris. Chris was probably the most strident environmentalist on the commission and very outspoken. When Chris turned up after lunch, I told her the enviros had been looking for her and asked her where she'd been. She said she'd been to lunch with Russ, another member of the commission. This surprised me because Russ was a nice guy, but a rather conservative commissioner who was more inclined to side with developers. Chris explained, I needed a break. The, enviro the enviros are always so angry. I needed to laugh, and Russ makes me laugh, so I went to lunch with him. Chris, the consummate enviro on the commission, hung out with Russ rather than her tribe that day because she needed to laugh. We all need to laugh. We need comic relief from life. Shakespeare recognized this early on. One of his innovations as a playwright was to break with the classical tradition and use humor in his tragedies to break up too much somber substance. Think of the body humorous nurse in Romeo and Juliet or the gravedigger scene in Hamlet, where they joke about their line of work. Humor can create community. My kids are half Asian and my daughter is gay. We share Asian and lesbian jokes. These jokes could be very inappropriate in some settings, but for us it's a way of poking fun at our family. They're in-jokes, as Peg mentioned, and they provide a bond, a connection for us. Ricky Gervais, a British comic, ended his Netflix stand-up special with a quote, if you can laugh in the face of adversity, you're bulletproof. Though obviously there are certain things that should not be joked about, I think what he means is that if you can laugh at yourself, you can take away the power for people to laugh at you. So when former President Trump attacked Greta Thunberg on Twitter, she changed her own Twitter bio to the description he tweeted of her showing a thick skin and a dry sense of humor. Similarly, two Stanford Business School researchers recommended that people in charge in a business develop a self-deprecating <coughs> sense of humor. People who do seem more human. They more easily connect with their employees, and the self-deprecator can appear even more powerful than she is. If the boss can poke fun at herself, she must be confident in her abilities. I don't think anyone here would be surprised at what an internet search on humor and mental health revealed. Having a sense of humor helps you be more resilient, more flexible, more able to bond with others, and more adept at coping with stress. So humor is good for us. But what can we learn from it? More particularly, what can we learn from jokes about us? And by that, I mean jokes about you use. One April Fool's Day, the Reverend Erica Hewitt a UU minister, gave a sermon about UU jokes. She argued that many jokes about UUs conveyed serious messages and suggested we could and should learn from the jokes told about us. As the Romanian proverb goes, the truth is told in jokes. So what can we learn? When I was reading through the many, many UU jokes that exist, one joke that stung a little was this one. What's the definition of UU diversity? Four colors of Priuses in the church parking lot. Okay, that's kind of funny, but it also kind of hurts. And there's, then there's a line of jokes about our penchant for intellectual discussion and argument. A UU died and, much to her surprise, discovered that there was indeed an afterlife. The angel in charge told her, because you were an unbeliever and a doubter and a skeptic, you will be sent to hell for all eternity. 
In your case, that consists of a place where no one will ever disagree with you again. <laughs> what are the Unitarian Universalist sacraments? Doubt, argument, and voting. Arguing with a UU is like mud wrestling with a pig. Pretty soon you realize the pig likes it. <laughs> okay, so we like to argue and debate, but then there's, how can you tell a Unitarian Universalist? You can't, they already know it all. <laughs> a sign at a UU church read, Bible study after service today. Bring your own Bible and a pair of scissors. <laughs> Why do UUs believe they are more generous than members of other denominations? Because they always give freely of their criticism. Hmm, are we a little too self-righteous sometimes? And how does that bear on our intent of being inclusive? As a former UUFB board member and the current chair of a committee, I love the jokes about how we do things. Once again, why did the UU cross the road? A third answer, to get to the committee meeting. If an airplane were about to crash, some of the passengers would cry, some would pray, but a UU minister would try to organize a committee on air safety. <laughs> what is a UU's most holy book? Robert's Rules of Order. How many UU's does it take to change a light bulb? There are lots of funny answers to this, but I like this one. Well, they've got a discussion group going, and a committee's working on it, and they've written a questionnaire and tallied all the responses, but they can't come to an agreement on the exact number. <laughs> Two UUs were sitting at the back of the room at a particularly raucous congregational meeting. One turned to the other and said, nobody will mistake us for an organized religion. Peg mentioned the UU Hysterical Society. They have 32 committees, including the What Color Do We Call the Hymnal <laughs> Committee? <laughs> the Committee to Address Redundancy of Committees. And the Seating Committee, which includes the Who Sits Where Subcommittee, the Don't Glare at Newcomers in Your Seat Subcommittee, the Aesthetics of Seating and Coordination with Paint Colors Subcommittee, and the Theological Implications of Pews versus Chairs Subcommittee. Does any of that sound familiar? Reverend Hewitt, with some concern, points out that many jokes accuse us as being, as she puts us, puts it, so mushy on matters of faith that we don't know what we believe in. What do Unitarian Universalists believe in? Recycling. <laughs> what do you get when you cross a UU with a Jehovah's Witness? Somebody who comes knocking at your door for no apparent reason. <laughs> <laughs> and this quote from Lenny Bruce, I know my humor is outrageous when it makes the Unitarians so mad they burn a question mark on my front lawn. UUs have a very lively, sustaining faith in they don't quite know what. Actually, these jokes make me kind of proud that we champion a responsible search for truth and meaning, but could they suggest that we, we might want to be a bit more articulate when we discuss our spiritual tradition with others? And these jokes also make me proud to be a UU. A fund fundamentalist Christian asserted to a UU, I hear you deny the divinity of Christ. That's untrue, said the UU. We don't deny the divinity of anyone. <laughs> and UUs are more interested in getting heaven into people than in getting people into heaven. To quote once again from Howard Thurman, who provided our opening words this morning, all the gods of depression, gloom, and melancholy must shriek with alarm when there rings down the corridor the merry music of the humorous spirit. So let us honor and celebrate humor and learn from it.